that fresh food that you see at the farmer's market, try different things. Some of the, like radishes, people are like, what do I do with a radish? You know? Well, most people raw on a salad. Roast them once. Slice them up, put them in a stir fry. Do different things with your food. Try it. It's, it's a good way to get a start. And again, do it with your family. Sit down, make the time to sit with your family. It is one of the best things you can do. Thank you. Chef Vesh, would you like to add to, to the conversation? I know you spoke, but I want to give you the opportunity. I'm just enjoying listening to it all. <laughs> no, but I think that the cooking is a key. And I think that um, getting back to the basics and of um, y y this, there's so many different levels when we're talking about our food supply, but if we don't change our personal habits, and if we don't affect the change of those around us, then that wheel ain't ever gonna turn. You know, and, and we're never gonna see the sort of um, rebirth of the family farm and the, or the resurgence of it in a way that's really gonna be meaningful and impactful. You know, I'm so, so glad to be here today. And I knew that I obviously was going to be here for this panel discussion because I committed to do so. But I don't know, Judith, if you ever got the voicemail that I left you yesterday evening. Originally, I had committed to come for dinner and to hear Paul Roberts talk about his book. You know, and I bought the book a month ago and I read the book. But um, when you really are a farmer, Stuff happens. That's a nice way to put it. So I had, I had, I had um, sent a voicemail. Yeah, <laughs> according to, yeah, in my vernacular, yes. Okay. All right. So, so I left a voicemail yesterday for um, Judith, and basically the voicemail is, you know what? I'm not coming tonight to the dinner. That's last night, and I told her I have a lot of compost piles to cover, and that really was what we were doing, and it was something that was really kind of time sensitive. But things worked out, and I slept there, and I got my 10-year-old son to sort of be my escort at the last minute. He was like, Mom, where are you going? I saw that book. Can I go? So we arrived, and um, I still, you know, been up since 4.30 in the morning. I mean, that's the way it goes. We have a license for all milk dairy, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And, and, you know, a little bit tired, but, you know, happy to be here. Enjoyed the dinner, enjoyed the chat. And then I got in this auditorium, and the auditorium was full last night. It was packed. It was really packed. First, you know, coming in, I was a little bit cynical because I saw that all you guys were swiping your cards. And I thought, eh, you know, mandatory attendance, right? And everybody's standing in line, you know, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. But then I got in, and I saw that the audience was full of people, and it was full of people who were maybe between the ages of 18 and 25. We old folks were very much the minority. And then I started hearing that that's a we, right? That's a we, right? And so then, except for you, maybe, baby. Except for you, maybe. It's all right. It's all right. Okay. And then I started hearing um, Paul's address, and I listened to the questions, and I saw the level of, um, of interest. And all of a sudden, I was awestruck, and I realized that what you guys are doing here, what you're trying to do, is it's huge, you know? And it's revolutionary, and revolutionary doesn't always have to do with people, you know, kicking and screaming and engaging in a lot of hyperbole. So people who were here yesterday, that was an incredible moment. I think this is an incredible moment. Um, I just want to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ramble a little bit, and I'll, I'll talk about myself a little bit, but, 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 but I think there's more important stuff to talk about than myself. Let me get the myself part out of the way. Last night when um, Paul was talking, he said, with such astonishment, he said, and there are these people who don't know anything about farming at all. You know, you have these people who are like doctors and lawyers, and they just one day decide that they're going to be Farmers and the learning curve is just huge, and they just buy farm. That's us. That's us. I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School, practiced law for a while. I did a joint degree at Harvard Law School and Harvard Divinity School. So I did a four-year program. I did six years and about four years, and I was ordained. Um, I met my husband at Harvard, and um, he and I got, got, got married, and all together we have ten children, seven biological children, Lukey is at, is, is at the end of that continuum. We have like the old uns, the young uns, and the middle uns. He's kind of on the young uns side. And um, 
my husband, I, I always have been involved in what you might generally call good guy stuff. You know, because I, I, I was ordained as a pastor and I did legal services law. I did a little bit of a stint, you know, with the Supreme, do, doing constitutional law. I started to say with the Supremes, right? Doing constitutional law. But, but, but mostly good guy stuff, you know, public interest law, legal services law. Um, um, and then always pastoring, always pastoring and everything that I'm involved. You know, did a lot of pastoral counseling and so on. And, but, but my safety, my safety was the fact that my husband was the straight guy. I mean, he is the one who had this meteoric rise through, through corporate America and wound up being the senior vice president of Verizon, corporate VP, making tons of money. And sort of the way our ministry worked was, you know, he made the money and we had a decision that we would spend it on all things good, okay? Um, as I started having children, our focus became more educationally oriented. You know, there's always this thrust about sort of like, so how then shall you live? You know, and it's whatever you believe in, whatever your fundamental set of principles are, there is sort of the art, which is wonderful to talk about. You know, you can sit on panel discussions, you can read books, and there's sort of the, the what is the is going to be? You know, how am I really going to live it? So as I started having kids, became very interested in education and sort of looked around and took a, 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 a hard look at what education in America is and, and, and what in so many instances it, it isn't. Um, and, and, and my husband always supported. We wound up going overseas and we started a tuition-free Christian academy in St. Kitts. And some of you might not even recognize the name of the country, St. Kitts, but it's, it's the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, second only to, to, to Haiti. Um, as we continued to do education, we came back to the United States and, and, and we just developed a really successful formula. It was just sort of God-inspired stuff for, for teaching children, for teaching bright children, for teaching children that, that, that had, been, had fallen through the cracks and had been labeled as, 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 as problem children. And it was really based on how shall you live? How shall you live? Strong information-based, com competitive academic program, but very, very hands-on. And very, very hands-on wound up centering very much around food. It's centered very much around, you know, the origins of everything. You know, where do I come from, but where does the food come from, and what's the systemic process by which it gets to us? And so, so, so that's kind of, you know, how we've lived. And, and living that way, finally brought us to Texas. And it brought us to Texas at a point where, um, you know, my husband one day, and this is just the made-for-TV version, right, the short story, because, you know, ups and downs and all of that kind of stuff that, that everybody experiences in life. But basically, one day my husband just decided, you know what, it's not enough just for me to throw money at this thing. You know, we need to really do this, and we need to invest all of our resources in it, not a big part. And, of course, you know, all along, school and, and other projects we were involved in. We had grants here and there. We, we, were, um, we came to the attention of the Bush administration, baby Bush, because he was doing you know, the No Child Left Behind thing and he was doing faith-based organizations and, and, and we've been evaluated so many times by so many people and always educationally come up you know, smelling like a rose in terms of the ki having kids that score so high on SATs and, and, and kids that do so well academically. And so I have children and that's not just the children that I've given birth to or the children that I've raised but it's the ones that I've educated literally all over the world. I have kids at Oxford now. I've I've got kids in France, I've got, I've got kids in Madagascar, I've got kids in South America, I've got kids all over the world. God brought us here. He brought us here with lots of money. It was a very comfortable model. You know, we were an affluent ministry. And, and we sort of evolved into a, a, a self-sustainable affluent ministry, which means that instead of always sticking our hands out to people, you know, please, you know, give me a million dollars, I'll be who you want me to be. You know, give me a hundred thousand dollars, I'll, you know, modify who my program this way. We got to a point that we just did investments. We just did investments and my husband's real good at it and the money would come back and we employed Oh, a lot of local people. I mean, I walk in Walmart and it's like reunion time, you know, because people who have been in our employ, you know, will run up and hi, you know, I'm doing this now, I'm doing that now. Came a time about three years ago when the bottom dropped down. You know, one bad investment, two bad investments, three bad investments, a little bit of money left, and you just sort of watch it, watch it trickle away. 
In the meantime, we had established ourselves as a very, very small school, but we had also established ourselves as a, te as a Texas licensed raw milk dairy. And we looked around and said, okay, all right, so it's easy to do it the cushy way. You know, the cushy way is, you know, you don't get along with your staff or you don't get along with your ministry team and you have a meeting and everybody decides that we need to drop $20,000 and go on retreat. Okay, we'll figure out those problems, you know. And that's one way to do things. And I'm not even disparaging that, but there came a time when we had nothing. And now we had to ask ourselves the question. So with nothing, you know, God said, do this. Do we do it? Do we continue to do it? And we looked around, and we had this raw milk dairy, and it's like, gosh, you know, I've never really done this really, really sustained hard work. What are you going to do? And what are you going to do is you're going to roll up your sleeves and do it. And that's where we are now. And it's an entirely different model because whereas you can always pay people to be who you want them to be, you know, okay, so you're a Christian organization, I'll come into this organization and I'll receive a salary. And, you know, who do you want me to be, Pastor? When the money goes, now there's another group of people who stay or who even come to you. And they come to you with the heart of a servant. And it's not because, you know, they have uh, selfish needs. And, and I don't mean for that to be a, a value-laden kind of, you know, judgmental when I say selfish, but, but, but needs that sit around just themselves. It's because they're trusting that, you know, if they meet other needs, if they give of themselves, you know, that, 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 that their individual and personal needs will be met. So that's who we are now, brand new model, okay? And now I just want to wander a little bit. I'm a pastor. Um, our, our organization is a Christian organization, so surprise, surprise, how do I look at the world? You know, I look at the world in terms of God and the Bible, right? I want to tell you a short little story, and it has to do with the missionary Paul. And we know that the missionary Paul wrote most of the New Testament, and we know that he had this incredible vision and he sent out to establish all these churches all over the place. And sometimes he would go into a community and establish a church, and the people would just like believe, and everything would now sit around Paul. You know, what does Paul say? Well, Paul said this, Paul said that, right? But there was a time when he'd been kicked out of Thessalonica, and he went to a place called Berea. And there's just this, there are like one or two lines in, this, in, in, in Acts 17, 11. And, and it talks about the fact that he came to this community called the Berean community, and he hung out with these guys for a long time until people, you know, got wind of the fact that he was a quiet revolutionary and decided to, you know, run him out of town. But the point is that one scripture says that every day Paul met with these guys. He met with everybody in the community. And after he met with them, they would then go back to their Bibles for themselves to evaluate the scriptures and determine the veracity, the truth, the truth of what he had said. So I'm going to challenge everybody in this room today to be a Berean. You know, be a Berean. That's the, you know, we can stand up and we can debate what's good and bad and who's right and who's wrong and what the politics of everything is. And at the end of the day, you know, it's other people's opinions and it's other people's perspectives. I want to just make a few comments. You know, I, I saw the, 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 the little handout and it says global, regional, local. And I just want to sort of maybe provide you with a few tools that can um, give you the wherewithal to sort of put things in context and, 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 and examine things for yourself and reach your own conclusions, okay? I want to talk about what's going on globally. I want to talk about what's going on regionally and locally. I want to begin by telling you that what's going on globally, sometimes we feel, feel so disconnected to, uh, to things, but what's going on globally has to do with your little niece or nephew who you say, gosh, you know, when I was growing up, I could sit still. How come this kid can't sit still anymore? It has to do with your brother or sister, or it has to do with your neighbor who, you know, you hear maybe talking to your mother and saying, you know, they want to put my child on these drugs to control their behavior, you know, and I don't understand why. I mean, I think, you know, I think that I have a good home structure, and I think everything's going well as far as the family. We're not having any crisis. Something is going wrong, and I don't feel good about this. 